Everybody hear me? Everybody? Okay, I'm Michael Carter, and it's glad to see all you people here again. Another good crowd. Uh, just real quick, to begin with, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to list about four of the next uh, programs, the next uh, four months or so. Uh, you've probably heard me do this before, but here we are again. Uh, August 29th, Dan Combs uh, will be here to give an encore performance of the, the show he did on the great flu epidemic of 1918. He did that about three years ago. And it uh, shows how it devastated our local area, just like it did the whole country. And uh, uh, it's a very good program. That's August 29th. September 26th, Bob Hamill will come here. I think most of you know Bob Hamill, sports editor for the HT. And I believe he's going to give a program on the great uh, black athletes, uh, uh, local black athletes of the past, uh, George Shively, George Talaferro, Bill Garrett, and others. Uh, October 31st, Dave Williams of the City Parks Department will be here and uh, do a program on the history of Cascades Park. And in addition, he'll do uh, include some of the other local parks too uh, in the city. Uh, we've seen that before and it's also a very interesting one. November 28th, Brad Cook will be here from the IU uh, Photo Archives. Uh, Brad uh, is given a three-part history of the Indiana University. He's given the first two parts and left off around 1930. So that's where he's going to start, 1930, and he'll be here November 28th. And now uh, our uh, commander of communications, I guess it's propaganda. My minister of propaganda, George Carpenter, has a few things to say here. Can I get the microphone this oh, time? Oh, yeah. Now you have to wait. Don't drop it. Minister of Propaganda again. Uh, did everyone get an email? Uh, because if you didn't get an email, you're probably not here. <laughs> it's as simple as it works. Uh, once again, I'm still trying to reconstruct my contact database for this group. So uh, I, I found out some people have been left out, including me. Uh, as usual, I'd like to thank the Legion for their facilities here and for the nine waitresses that take care of us, our servers, and do a great job. Please be generous with them. Also, I want to thank Cats TV. C uh, Cats is uh, the cat's meow, so to speak. We really, uh, really appreciate them. They are the ones that make it possible for us to be able to have the videos on YouTube. How many of you have seen the videos on YouTube? How many of you have subscribed? Yes, ma'am, did you subscribe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Both of you. <laughs> if, if you subscribe to the channel, you get automatic notifications when I put something new on there. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's handy to know. So far, we have almost 20 programs. So far, going back all the way to uh, 19 or uh, 2015, we have uh, about 20 programs on there. That's right. So, once again, thank you for coming. Look forward to seeing you again next month. Uh, we've got an outstanding presentation today. Thank you for being here. Bye bye. One other thing I was going to mention, I haven't talked about for a little while, was that uh, when we first started this this venture with about six people. We started out just sharing things. As Marilyn remember, we, I mean Shelby, we'd bring like old newspapers, old photos, this and that, and display them, you know. But we, we kind of got past that. There's not much time to do that anymore. But I would say that if anybody does have anything they want to share that's, that they consider important for people to look at, we could easily put it up there on this table and they could look at it either before or after the programs. Uh, Today, we've got Steve Roth as our speaker, and uh, Steve is the head of and co-founder of the local Civil War Roundtable. Uh, Steve was here once before, April 2016, uh, for a very good program. Th this one is about uh, a cemetery, the Buskirk, or Abel, or Wampler, or Spicer, 
cemetery. There's a few other names too. But and even other names, which reminds me of kind of Bloomington streets. You know, some of them have like multiple names, so it's kind of like that. Uh, this one is about uh, those, those cemeteries, and um, it demonstrates what one person can do uh, concerning the rehabilitation and preservation of a historic site. It's a repository of local history, and of one person who is unique amongst almost all soldiers of the Civil War. And I'll let Steve tell you all about that story. I didn't give you a whole program, did I? <laughs> okay. Make sure this is working. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, George. Thank all of you for coming here today. And I'm especially thankful. It's, it's always a good thing to get invited back to speak. I mean, the first time, they don't know that you're not a doofus. And uh, so this is my second appearance here. So I feel like I'm not going to do the Sally Field, oh, you love me thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I, that I passed muster the first time around. But thank you all for having me back here again. Um, it's, it's, no surprise to any of you, I'm sure, that I'm a history geek, and one of the things that I do is, I'm okay with it or without it, okay? one of the things that, that I do is I watch, I don't know if any of those, uh, American History TV on C-SPAN 3 on the weekends. Um, I'm, I got my DVR set up and I record things and my wife goes crazy because I'm interfering with her soap operas and stuff like that sometimes. But um, just recently, uh, a couple, three weeks ago, they had a, an interview on there with David McCullough. Uh, David McCullough is, if, uh, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people know who he is, but he is a historian author. He's actually not a professional historian, although he writes history, but he is an author. And most people remember him. He came on the scene big time back in the early 1990s when Ken Burns put the Civil War series on TV. And David McCullough was the <coughs> mellifluous voice of the, he was the narrator of that series. But anyhow, they were interviewing him and somebody asked him uh, about history and, and what it's like to write history, and, and when, especially when you're not a historian. And he said, the best thing that I can tell you is a quote from Barbara Tuckman. Now, I may be getting a little bit more obscure for you, but Barbara Tuckman wrote a book that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1963 called The Guns of August. It was about the beginning of, the, uh, back, uh, really it was about a month, the assassination of, of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the beginning of World War I. And I was 15 years old, and that book captivated me. So when David McCullough mentioned her name, anyhow, what his point was, that somebody asked her at one time, what, what is it that how do you get inspired to write history? Why do you do this? And how hard is it? And she said, there is no trick to writing history. Just tell stories. And that's what they do. It's what I've done in the past. When I don't like, I mean, you need to know battles and dates and things if you're a Civil War geek like me. You need to know all that stuff, but it comes in time. But I like to tell the stories of the people. I've I, I like some of the obscure people. I like to talk about people like Montgomery Meigs, who I believe is the second most important general in the Union War most people have never heard of. He was the quartermaster general that supplied the Union Army during the war. Or I like to talk about Ely Parker, who was the only Native American general officer in the Civil War. He was actually on Grant's staff at Appomattox uh, and was the person that was chosen in the end to write the <coughs> surrender terms because he had the best handwriting. He was a trained lawyer. He was a Seneca Indian from upstate New York, but he was a trained lawyer. He could not be a lawyer his entire life because he was not a citizen, because he was an Indian. He was a Native American, and they would not allow him to, to uh, practice law because of that. Um, so anyhow, people like that. And of course, Frank Fee is the person that I talked about the last time, a very local person who's buried just a few, uh, maybe I should say 100 yards, I don't know, from us up here in Rose Hill Cemetery. But anyhow, that's what I love to do, is to tell stories about people. And that's what I intend to do today, is to tell you some stories about a cemetery, about a person who was instrumental in uh, maintaining or rehabilitating, maybe I should say, that cemetery a few years ago, and why, and why she did it, and that kind of thing. Um, and the story of, I, one of one of my other favorite people, and that would be, uh, 
Big Dave Van Buskirk, who was the largest, physically the largest soldier in the Union Army in the Civil War, and I'll get into that more in a few minutes. Um, so anyhow, here you have the cemetery. This cemetery is sort of obscure, sort of out of the way, but I still believe that it is a Monroe County treasure. Um, its location, and if, I don't know how well you can see this, but its location is in the very northwest corner of Monroe County. Uh, if Bloomington's right here. This is, this is basically Gosport right up in here. Um, and you can see where the yellow area, arrow is. That's where the cemetery is located. Um, I don't know, I always ask people this. Anybody here familiar with Sand College Road? Okay, I usually get that answer. I didn't know it existed either. Sand College Road runs from what used to be off the Gosport Bridge and runs up and really connects with Wampler Road, Moon Road, down into Steinsville and everything. But it's not a very long road. But that's where this cemetery is located. And I've got to say up front, and we can talk about this later or whatever, this cemetery is not visible from the road. It's not accessible. You have to cross private property to get there. So don't go out looking for it unless you have permission, because who knows what could happen. Um, OK, it is uh, the, the, the first known interment was in 1840, give or take. I'm not exactly sure of that date. Uh, and we'll talk about this, this headstone here a bit more in a few minutes. Um, but this is the very first one. Um, and this is a picture, a little broader picture of the cemetery. And the lady in the picture there is who I'm going to talk about uh, here in a minute. And her name is Patsy Powell. How many people in this room know Patsy Powell? Yeah, I figured there'd be a few people. Patsy is a legend, uh, not in her own mind, in all of our minds. And uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm hearing that she is not doing very well right now. And that's a shame, because she has become a, a good friend of mine over the years. And I haven't talked to her or seen anything in a while. Um, OK, oh, well. Should back up here to point out this is, by the way, a family cemetery. It's not a totally private cemetery for one family, but has several families in it, as, as uh, Michael referred to a minute ago. Um, it's not a municipal cemetery like Rose Hill or Valhalla, and it's not connected to any church or denomination. It's just a, a uh, burial ground for people that lived in this area at that time. Um, I always tell people, by the way, that if you, if you, this is so close to Morgan County, if you stand up and fall twice to the north, you're probably going to be in Morgan County. It's not very far away. Uh, and there are about 60 known graves in it. And I'm going to say it now before I forget to say it later. I brought a few handouts up here, a very few, if anybody's interested in seeing the names of the people that this is information that Patsy came up with and gave to me years ago. Uh, the names of the people that she know that are buried there. I've got a few copies here, and you can look at them. Uh, you can take them. There's only four or five. If, I, if we run out, and give me an email or let me know, and I'll get the information to you if you're interested. But they're up here on the table. OK, some of the names, and Michael just mentioned those, some of the names that are there, Buskirk or Van Buskirk. I guess maybe I should clear that up right now. Patsy always told me, she said, when we lived out in the country, we were Van Buskirk, but when, moved, when most of us moved to the city, we dropped the van and became cityfied, and we were just Buskirks then. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what she always said. Um, Abel, uh, another name that you see prominently up there. And pardon my PowerPoint, it went haywire on me, so I have to reload the pictures every time. And Wampler, of course, this is just above the intersection, it's on a hill above the intersection of Wampler Road and Moon Road. Uh, and Dave uh, Van Buskirk's house at that time was at that intersection, or near it anyway. And then, last name for now, Spicer. There are other names there, though, and I'll get into one of those in a few minutes and tell you about uh, the name Byers, and you'll see why. OK. This cemetery has, uh, and you know, what an appropriate setting to be in the Legion here to talk about the, the, the people that have defended our country over the years. It has two Revolutionary War veterans in it. It has two veterans of the War of 1812 in it. 
and it has a, several civil, my area, several Civil War veterans, especially some veterans of the 27th Indiana Infantry, which we'll see here in a few minutes, which is it was called the Monroe Grenadiers. And I'm going to talk when I get to Big Dave. I'll, I'll talk about their their service in the Civil War. Um, but let's talk about Patsy for a minute because she is just, as I said, something special. She is a person who was dedicated. I don't expect you to read that, by the way. I've got a copy here. There's a couple of things. This was a, an article, as you can see, that, that appeared in the Ellisville Journal in 2007, but this was uh, where Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana pre was presenting Patsy with their one of their 2007 service, Servas, maybe it's pronounced, Memorial Award for her success in raising public awareness of historic preservation in Owen and surrounding counties. Now, Patsy lives in Monroe County. But of course, when she grew up, there was a bridge over to Gosport, and basically she was known as a Gosport resident because that's where she went to shop and say, well, it's hard to get to Gosport from this area right now. Um, but uh, in going down this, they say, when, when Historic Landmarks Foundation presents a Servas Award to an individual, they say, we look, quote, for sustained commitment to preservation advocacy. Patsy Powell is the embodiment of that phrase, sustained commitment to preservation advocacy. Um, her nominators and supporters for this award called Patsy a blindly persistent, fearless, and humorous advocate and persuader, a writer of grants who also shows up in work boots to carry debris out of houses. So she's just that kind of person, and, and, and she is a, a wonderful person, and um, I will miss her by not being able to see her like I used to. Um, and, and Randall Shepard, who was at that time on the Supreme Court of the State of Indiana, helping, he says, I should point out that while Patsy is identified with preservation in Owen County at that time, because she had done some things. Let's see, where's the list of things here? She had uh, the Owen County Preservations Incorporated. She projects to save and restore the Robinson, Worman, and Dyer houses, Spencer's Carnegie Library, which turned into the Owen County Heritage and Culture Center, and of course the Tivoli Theater. But he said, even though she's recognized at that as, as an Owen County person, he said she works in all three counties. She anything that's historic, she she goes after with a vengeance. Um, and that's where the story of this cemetery comes up. This is her house, which is on Sand College Road. This is an 1880s farmhouse, um, and I've met that dog several times. Uh, it always comes out to greet you when you pull in the driveway. It's a beautiful house. It was in the family. I'm not exactly sure, and it was going to get sold outside the family, and Patsy went to her husband, her husband Marvin, who was still living at the time, and she said, we're going to buy that house. And he said, I don't want that old drafty house. What am I going to do with it? He said, we're going to buy that house. And so Marvin, of course, obeyed and bought the house. And then they spent years fixing it up. And it is something, if you'd ever get the chance to see it, it is a piece of work on the inside historically. It's full of antiques, just chock full of antique furniture. She has a Hoosier kitchen in her kitchen, if you're familiar with Hoosier kitchens. But one of the things, and of course she's got lots of memorabilia from her career as a music teacher for grade school children in Monroe County. That was her career until she retired. But one of the things that's really cool that I like there, this is supposed to be, a, I never compared it, a three-quarter replica of the Lincoln bed that currently is in the White House. Why it got there, I don't think she was even sure, but anyhow, it is a really cool piece. And she has it, most of the bedrooms, of course, were upstairs. This is downstairs where anybody that comes to the house can walk around the corner and see it. Hasn't been used, I don't think, for a bed for many, many years. But let's go on to the restoration of the cemetery. Uh, when she started, well, when she decided to start this project, this cemetery was really, really in bad shape. And if you look here, you can see, let me get around here, you can see headstones lying on their, on their faces here, a uh, pile of rubble here, Things were in bad shape, and this was much, it was true of the entire cemetery. And of course, it was her family cemetery. And she was not going to, because she is, uh, in essence, a Van Buskirk. Uh, she Marvin, uh, married Marvin and became a pal, but she's a, she's a Van Buskirk originally. And uh, so in 2001, 
she just made the decision that she wanted the cemetery to be restored, maintained, fixed up, do whatever it takes to do that. Um, and in her usual way, she decided she was not going to have anybody say no to her, that this was going to happen. And she had no idea what she was going to do, I don't think. After getting into it a little bit, she figured out, hey, this is not a do-it-yourself project. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have the equipment, the abilities to do that. So what she did was she talked to some people, and she found out that there was a company in Connersville, Indiana, called Graveyard Groomers. And I honestly don't know. This has been 15 years ago, so I don't know if Graveyard Groomers is still around. But at that time, they specialized in, in this, and we'll get into the details of everything. But it was a, just, a, I think, a man and wife. But, but they had the expertise, and, and they would come and help her fix up for a price. And that's what one of the things that Patsy did. That's where she kicked in. She donated her own money. She talked to the other people, the Spicers and the Abels and the Wamplers and all those kind of people, and got as much money out of everybody else as she could. So Graveyard's, Graveyard Groomer came, and they were experts at gravesite locating, because if you have a gravesite that no longer has a headstone on it, maybe you don't even know where it is, they, they have ways, they had ways both with uh, physical ground probing and with um, um, ground penetrating radar and those kinds of things to figure out where the graves were. And go again here. And at monument locating, because the monuments get knocked over and they actually can get buried over the years, so they found a number of them and repaired them, restored them. I'll show you some of those here in just a minute. And finally, they helped her with a little bit of historical analysis, although that's not the big deal in the thing. So in 2002, they came. They located the grave sites that I was talking about. Uh, pardon my PowerPoint. It went haywire on me the other day, and I haven't been able to fix it yet, so I have to reload things as I go here. They located many of these headstones. From what I understand, there's always the possibility of vandalism and those kinds of things, but mostly what I think damaged this was in the 1920s. I believe it was in the mid-20s. If it wasn't a tornado, it was darn close, and it came and just swept right across the hillside and really messed up a lot of the stones and a lot of the monuments in the cemetery. So, and, it, and nobody had ever really done anything about it since then. Um, so they reset many stones and repaired, as I said, and you'll, again, I'll show you some examples here in a minute. Uh, they came and they did an interesting thing. These people come and they spend a week at a time at the place and they bring a camper and they just camp out and they just work there all the time for the week that they're there. That's what they did. And I think she had this done three times um, at $2,000 a pop, and we're talking 15 years ago. I'm sure it would be more today if they did that. Um, and Patsy always told me, she says, I wish I could have brought him one more time, but I ran out of money. That's the way life is sometimes. Although I think she did wonders, they did wonders with, with uh, the amount of money that they put into it. So let's look at some of the results. This is a headstone before the restoration. Doesn't look too bad, but isn't it pretty now? Nice and white and that kind of thing. Uh, this is, okay, I, we'll talk a little bit about this headstone here since I'm here. This is... Um, the headstone, of the oldest headstone, as I mentioned, in the cemetery, and it's for Isaac, uh, who they called revolutionary Isaac Van Buskirk. And uh, he died in 1840 and was buried here. And if you read through that whole thing there, it gives a little bit of his life's history. Nobody has headstones like this anymore. But it's, uh, it's a really cool thing. But there it is, cleaned up, much nicer looking. Uh, this is one of my Civil War people that's there. This one, I think, is Bennett Van Buskirk, also a Civil War veteran. And then this one, as you can see, was clearly broken in the middle, and probably somebody had glued it back together so it just you know, looked that way. But they took it and made it so it almost looks like it wasn't broken. I mean, if you look at it, you can tell, but it's, it's very close. 
But this is the thing, and it's interesting because this is the family that, that probably has the least connection to the cemetery anymore, but this is the one that just blows you away when you go there. And if you'll remember, I showed this picture originally, um, and if you look, you can see a, a pot, a finial, sitting on top of this stuff and some rubble back here. Uh, so graveyard groomer looked at this, and they talked to Patsy, and they looked at uh, talk to other family members, and when they got done, this is what it looks like. <laughs> and that's what everybody does. It's a wow factor kind of a thing. Uh, the people's name are Byers, and they're the only, I think the only, that's the only gravestones, uh, the only monument to the Byers in the entire cemetery that I, if I remember correctly, um, because the, the line died out in, uh, when they went away in, back in the late 19th century. But I just think that is fantastic. And you can see the, the pot, the finial, that is now in its proper location up on the top of the arch instead of just sitting down where it would have been between where these two columns are now. A um, couple more shots of it. it. It really is something special. There, again, this is the before and after so that you can get a real good effect, a real good idea of what was done. And as I say, it is the centerpiece today. Now, let's meet some of the people who are in the cemetery. Uh, this is Revolutionary Isaac, which we've talked about. Uh, and and uh, here is a, a combative date. I've got 1843. I've also got 1840. I'm not exactly sure where it is, and I'm not sure that it makes that much difference now. Uh, but anyhow, he was in the Battle of Monmouth in the Revolutionary War, uh, came here and settled after that, lived the rest of his life here, and is buried there. And note the name Isaac. You're going to see it again, and again, and again. <laughs> that's what people did. They passed names down before. And that's the reason he's called Revolutionary Isaac, because he is the one from the Revolutionary War. OK, this is uh, a mid middle name Isaac. I'm not sure of a relationship here, but here is a man who was buried out there from the Revolutionary era. That I mean, think about this. We've got a guy buried out in the northwest corner of Monroe County who came to America with the Marquis de Lafayette, who was, of course, a protege of George Washington, uh, came back to America 50 years later to a grand tour, and this guy came with him on the first, on the first trip over and stayed, obviously. <coughs> Okay, now we have Grandfather Isaac. Grandfather Isaac was the son of Revolutionary Isaac, as you can see, and he's a veteran of the War of 1812, of which we have two of them. And this one, uh, this person is uh, Deaf Ike, another Isaac, and that's the reason you see the nicknames. This is so the family could differentiate when they talked about all the Isaacs in the family. Oh, who are you talking about? Oh, that's Deaf Ike. Okay, well, you can pretty much guess why he, he must have had a hearing problem, and that's how he got his nickname. It probably wouldn't be PC today to call him Deaf Ike, but that was the way that it went back then. Uh, and he is the one on the right. Um, he's actually not in this cemetery. He's nearby in Liberty Cemetery, but I had, to throw his, I had to throw him in here. Okay, this is the gravestone to Blue Ike. Like I say, they, they got good use out of a name. Uh, he's a cousin to Deaf Ike, and he was on the left in this photo, so you can see him over there. And this is one that I've always had a little bit of fun with. I, I've done this presentation, talked about this with fifth graders, because the fifth grade is when you study the Civil War in Monroe County, and I've, I've spoken for a number of fifth grade classes in my time. And I've always asked him, I say, okay, what, why is this guy called Grandfather Isaac? Well, because he was a grandfather. Oh, okay, yeah. And how about this guy? Why was he called Deaf Ike? Well, he probably didn't hear very well. Yeah, that's true. But why do you think this guy was called Blue Ike? And the answers that I usually get, which are never correct up front, <laughs> are, oh, he was sad. You know, fifth graders, he was really sad. Or they will say, okay, he, he fought for the Union Army. He wore a blue uniform. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Actually, Blue Ike was Blue Ike because he was born with a very prominent, and I can't remember which cheek is on, blue birthmark on one of his cheeks. So he became Blue Ike for the rest of his life. Um, and he is the only person that I know of that died 
in battle or as a result of battle. Uh, he died on May 17, 1863. I have not researched this history, but the 27th Indiana was um, involved in the Battle of Chancellorsville, which was May 3rd, 1863. It was the, the last big thing uh, that led up to the Gettysburg Campaign in the summer of 1863. And my assumption is that he probably was wounded in some way and lingered for a couple of weeks and died uh, as a result of that battle. Um, I say that, and I should tell you, again, back to my Civil War geekness, uh, there were lots more deaths from disease and sickness in the Civil War than there was from battle wounds. But this sort of lines up. This one sort of lines up. Sandy Van Buskirk, you can guess what color his hair was. Uh, again, another member of the 27th Indiana Infantry. And then this one, Theodore, the and notice the spelling, if I could blow the headstone up, it is, and, and, and some of the, I think on this thing it's spelled with an O, like Theodore Roosevelt. But if you blow that headstone up, it's an A. It's Theodore. I, I don't know the, the story behind that. Obviously, um, lived well into the 20th century. Uh, this is Bennett that we talked about earlier. Um, in the 115th Indiana Infantry, there were a lot of soldiers in the Civil War from the state of Indiana. Indiana contributed, depending upon who you talk to, the second or the third most as a percentage of their state uh, population to uh, the Union Army in the Civil War. Ahead of, uh, I think, uh, Pennsylvania was the only state to beat them, so ahead of New York and some of the other big... Part of that was because uh, Indiana sort of sat out here in the middle and they sent soldiers to the Western Theater. There were a lot of Indiana regiments at Shiloh uh, and, and uh, Fort Donelson and that kind of thing. But then they also sent, as we'll see here in a minute, they sent soldiers to the Eastern Theater too, so the Antietam, Gettysburg, with the ones, the battles with the star power in the Civil War. Those are, those are the ones that everybody remembers. Um, Mr. Goebel, who is a brother-in-law to Blue Ike. I mean, everybody's related up here. Uh, Joseph Wampler. Um, and if you look at that, it says he's married to Sarah Gorda Van Buskirk, the daughter of Blue Ike. And if you know anything about the Mexican War, there was the Battle of Sarah Gorda. And I'll get into another little story that's even more like this in a minute. But it's an interesting name. Why would somebody name their, their child Sarah Gorda? Well, it's because he was involved with that battle. And it meant that much to him. Uh, James Davis. Uh, I used to be able to tell you his relationship to the family. I've forgotten it at the moment. Sorry about that. It's been a while since I've done this presentation. And David Evans. This was clearly the before... Before rest restoration, see, he is another relative. Uh, but, the, but the star of our show is always for me, Big Dave, Captain David Campbell Van Buskirk, who, as I said, was the largest soldier in the Union Army physically in the Civil War that anybody's ever been able to know. He was six, ten and a half, six eleven, 6'11", uh, weighed 350 pounds when he went into the service. Um, and as I say, he lived up at the corner of, of uh, Moon and Wampler Road. Um, he was for years called the largest soldier in the entire war. And I'll come to something in a minute that, eh, that unfortunately that's not true. I, I don't know whether that's a thing that you want to or not. But anyhow, he weighed, uh, as I said, 350 pounds when he went. He actually weighed more after serving in the service and, and being in a prison camp. Uh, in, 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 and there's a story behind that, when he came out of the war. Um, this is his marker. Uh, the before is on the right here, and the after is on the left, I think. All, he is buried there, all three of his wives. He had three wives, and I'll delineate that here a bit more in a minute. They're buried, I think one of them is on the right, and two of them are on the left, if I remember the, the thing. They all died. He, he wasn't divorcing people. He was, uh, unfortunately, I don't know whether he was mean to him or no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, okay, he's, he's right there, as you can see, the second from the right. And it's, it's, this is a picture, by the way, um, that I took from the book, The uh, Giants in the Cornfield, which is about the 27th Indiana Infantry. But you can sort of see his head sticks above the other, others. And look at his knees, how he's sort of scrunched up and his knees are sticking up. If he stood up, I can guarantee you he would tower over the other, over his, uh, 
his brothers, cousins, everybody else in the room. In the Civil War era, uh, six feet was tall. And one of the things that the, one of the ways that the 27th Indiana Infantry is remembered, um, during the Civil War there was great competition to recruit regiments to go off to service in the war. Everybody had a gimmick. Well, in this case, for the 27th, they put some people in the back of a train between Indianapolis and Louisville, a Monon train. Was it Monon, was it Monon then? 1860? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know he knows trains, and I don't. <laughs> but anyhow, they would do stump speeches off the back of the train, so they would hit all of the, you know, Martinsville, Bedford, Bloomington, and all the way up and down the line, and what they decided to do was they were going to recruit a regiment of soldiers who were so big that they would simply intimidate the rebels to drop their weapons and run. Okay, I'll tell you it didn't work that way. We'll get into that in a minute. It did not work that way. Um, but uh, the, I believe the figure is about 50% of the regiment was over six feet. Um, now, that's a lot of people, too, because a regiment full-fledged to begin with in the Civil War, a regiment was a 1,000 men, 10 companies of 100 men each. Now, very quickly, most regiments started dwindling down, and, and when we get to the, something else here in a minute, I can get to where they were at the height of their, of their service. This is the monument to the 27th Indiana Infantry that's in this. Anybody here been to Gettysburg? Come on, somebody put their hand if you go over, uh, there are seven um, Indiana regimental markers on the battlefield at Gettysburg and the state monument. Um, and this one is, by the way, very near the state monument. In fact, the state monument would be just over to the right of this picture, maybe 100 yards. Um, the others are scattered all over the battlefield because you've got the 19th Indiana, the 20th Indiana, the 7th Indiana, the 14th Indiana. Let's see if I can do this right. The 3rd Cavalry. Uh, missing one along the way someplace, but um, anyhow, this is to the 27th Indiana, and it's and it's an interesting story in it, in itself. I'm getting a little bit away from Monroe County here, but these were Monroe County people that did this, that that fought here. If you look in the background, there's a tree line. They were actually facing. I, I would be, or when I took this picture, I would be in the forefront of where the Confederates were at a tree line on the other side of an open swale or an open field. The 13th uh, New Jersey was to the left in this photo. The 27th Indiana was behind this monument. The second Massachusetts was to the right. And interestingly enough, again, if you've been to Gettysburg, there's over 1,400 monuments on the battlefield. The second Massachusetts was the first regimental marker, and it's just out of this picture on the right. This was the second, 1882, I believe it was set. Um, and it's been there ever since. And it's interesting that it's sitting on that boulder because you would think, well, why didn't they put it on the ground? Most of the soldiers who went back and talked about this and said they, they used that boulder to hide behind and, and, and that was a very, very prominent feature in the battle. So they put their monument on top of the boulder. And I've been there, I can't tell you how many times I've been there. Uh, it's a sort of a pilgrimage of mine. I go and I get a chair and I just sit there for a while and, and absorb it all. Um, now, this is back to whether Big Dave was the biggest man in the entire Civil War. This picture was used um, for years at the Monroe County History Center, and it was called, this is Big Dave and Busker. I had a member of my round table who went to a Chautauqua in upstate New York, and she was walking along looking at a table, and she looked down, and she saw the picture, she said, oh, it's Big Dave. No. It's not. The story there was it was a, a man named Martin Van Buren Bates. Um, go ahead on up here. Who was a Confederate soldier and was taller. He was seven feet two inches tall. Uh, and he had been misidentified over the years. Um, interestingly enough, by the way, Martin Van Buren Bates married a woman who was taller than he was. And they had several children, and all of them were normal height. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyhow, this, this is an interesting photo because this is Patsy and her sister. And this mannequin, life-size doll, whatever, 
if you could see it up close, there was a fellow from the, the Quad Cities area over on the Mississippi River who um, made these mannequins, military mannequins, and took them around to shows and events and things like that. And he made one of Big Dave because of Big Dave's fame as being the biggest soldier in the Union Army. And we talked him into having it here one time, not, not this time. This is when they went to see it someplace else. But I had him, actually had him bring it here, and we put it in the Monroe County History Center for a, an exhibit that we ran for about three months down there. And actually, if you got up close to it, it was a little bit grotesque. In fact, all this, the employees of the History Center used to call him Sausage Fingers because he had these you know, hor horrific hands that just looked like he was either arthritic or diseased or something. But the thing that was perfect about this mannequin was that it was the exact height that Big Dave was. So you, re you could stand next to it and get a good sense of how big this man was. And I'll, I'll finish my story about his bigness, too. He went into Libby Prison in Richmond, uh, Virginia in... Uh, 1862 and was held there and he was such a unique um, individual to look at that people would come in just to look at him because he was so huge and he ended up figuring out ways to get food out of that so you know he was he, okay you're going to come and see me you can bring me something so he ended up weighing over 400 pounds when he left the service uh, it's not exactly what you think of, of say a World War II prisoner of war camp or something like that, he made it work for him. And he went back, he, this was before Gettysburg, he went back, and the 27th, by the way, I should uh, finish the story about that, they went across that field where that monument was, and this is where the, the, uh, the bigness worked to their disadvantage because 300, there were about 380 members in the regiment at that time, and they charged across this field, and the, the Confederates were ready for them, and they had to look over and say, man, this is a turkey shoot. Look at the size of these guys. We can't miss. And indeed, they couldn't miss. They made it about halfway across the field. If you go to the Spangler Spring area today, they even have a little monument that's about uh, 50 or 60 yards out away from where that monument was on the stone in the middle of the field called the Farthest Advance Monument. They had uh, eight color bearers that went down in the attack. Four of them were killed, four of them were wounded. Uh, if you're familiar with a color bearer, they didn't carry a weapon, they just carried a flag, which I think is sort of nutty, but you know, it was a big, it was a big honor. And, and, and the, but they had four killed and four wounded in that attack, but they, got, they did get beat back. They, they did not successfully complete that. That was in the morning of July 3rd, 1863. The battle that everybody remembers on July 3rd, 1863, typically is uh, Pickett's Charge, which happened in the afternoon. This happened very early in the morning, depending upon who you listen to, 4.30 to 6, 7 o'clock in the morning is when this started. Um, anyhow, this is Big Dave later in life. Um, after he came home, um, and you, it, that is him, that is his picture, and you can see his size compared to the other two gentlemen in the photo. But he came home and spent the rest of his life being a prominent citizen of Monroe County. And uh, I have a little, everybody loves show and tell. I'm, this is a big group, but I'll still pass it around. This is something, if, if any of you knew Bob Stewart, Stewart's Gun Shop, uh, Bob gave me this one time, bless his heart, because he knew that I was so interested in this. But this is a check, and it's in plastic, but this is the original check. This is a check uh, in the auditor's office, Bloomington, Indiana, November 5th, 1869, so it would have been four years after the war was over, pay to David V. Buskirk, $60.71 interest paid on school fund. Uh, and if you look it over on the back, it's endorsed on the back. Big Dave endorsed it on the back. So uh, it's just a fun thing to pass around. But I, I knew we needed one show and tell thing. And, and I do have guards stationed at the back door, so I do want that back. Um, it's not much, but it's interesting, and I treasure it. So today, this cemetery stands as what I think is a real, as I say, a monument of the whole to Patsy's restoration efforts, which were significant, to the service of Monroe County residents, in all of our wars, especially the Civil War, of course, there's more in that cemetery of that from that war than anything. Um, and 
just to the, the I don't know what I want to say, the glory of, of, uh, of what our history for us all around is. Um, I had a thought there, and I lost it. OK, anyhow. But uh, that's pretty much, this isn't the longest program I've ever done, but that's pretty much what I've got to say. But I'll be happy to entertain any questions from anybody, if somebody has any. So yes, sir? Uh, Southern guy who was 7'2", it looked like in that photo he had on Union colors. It seemed to. I, I wonder. It was, it was dark. There's no doubt about that. Um, but especially at the beginning of the war, many Confederate troops were wearing blue uniforms. It became a problem, in fact. It, it, it's a little bit like the story of the Confederate flag, too, which went through several things and, and became a problem because, because it looked too much like the Union flag. Every, you know, they were adopting everything, red, white, and blue colors and that kind of thing. But it, it, it is dark. I'm not sure. It, it could even be a different color. It could be brown. Many people had their own uniforms made. Uh, so it could be something like that, but, but it's not Big Dave, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. I wish I could say there was. And at one time they had that picture, they had a foam core thing made out of it at the History Center, again, that you could go back up against and you could, it was measured off and like, like you do on doors when kids grow up. And you could see how tall you were compared to him. They still have a little cardboard cutout thing of him at the History Center. It's, that, it's part of that story. I just saw that a couple of weeks ago. Part of that story about him getting and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's he's just an interesting character, and he's he's somebody like I say that I stumbled across. I can remember looking at that picture, which was the wrong picture, when I years and years and years ago is the thing that sort of sparked my interest. In it. And then when somebody introduced me to Patsy at a point, and and she by the way did I say this that she is Big Dave's great granddaughter? Sorry, I missed that along the way, didn't I? She is Big Dave's great granddaughter. Oh, and the story that I was going to tell, uh, we talked about Sarah Gorda. Patsy told me as she grew up, she talked, people talked about her Aunt Getty. And you might be able to see where this is going. Her Aunt Getty was Big Dave's daughter. Is that, is that the right thing? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And she found out when she got a little older that her Aunt Getty's full name was Gettysburg. And what that tells you is how much these engagements meant to these people, what it meant in their lives, that they would name their children after a Civil War battle. I think that's just sort of incredible. I don't know that anybody would do that. Can you, can you see, you know, this is my, this is my grandson, or this is my son Iwo Jima or something, you know. It, it just doesn't work anymore. Uh, yes, sir. Where was he captured? He was captured at the first Battle of Winchester. If you're familiar with the Civil War, there were three significant battles of Winchester. Actually, there were a bunch more. Winchester was one of those hands, that, depending upon which day of the week it was, it belonged to the Confederates or the Union. Winchester, Virginia, I'm talking about. And he was, he was captured at the first Battle of, of Winchester, and he was sent to Libby Prison, uh, which was a, uh, an old warehouse, and, and it doesn't exist anymore, an old warehouse in downtown uh, Richmond, Virginia, that they housed. And, and, there, are, there were beams from that warehouse. This is another little story, but I used to be friends with the fellow, and unfortunately he can't travel down from Fort Wayne much anymore. I haven't seen him in a while. But a man named Bob Willie who actually engineered, there were a bunch of beams that were found uh, that were from Libby Prison. And he was able to get those and donate them to a museum as opposed to somebody who was going to buy them and have them cut up to make souvenirs out of them. Um, so I'm glad that Bob got involved in that one. Um, yes, sir? How was he uh, paroled, and then what was the service after? I, I don't know specifically, but I'm assuming it was a, it was a uh, prisoner exchange, because it was early enough in the war that that was very common that they would have. They, when the Civil War started, nobody anticipated it lasting more than two or three months. So nobody was prepared for the numbers of people that they had in hospitals, the number of people they needed to keep as prisoners and that kind of thing. So they figured, well, a way to do this is we'll exchange prisoners. And there was actually a pecking order. A captain was worth four sergeants. I mean, you know, if you go back, I can't remember what it all was. 
Uh, so I'm guessing that he was exchanged. Now that quit, and probably U.S. Grant was the one who quit it because they, they, uh, they decided that a lot of these soldiers were going back, and even though they signed a paper that said they would never go back and fight again, they all did. And so they, they finally quit that. Plus the fact Grant said, why should we give them back anybody that can fight? That's sort of dumb. Uh, so they, they quit exchanging. But my guess is that he was exchanged. Yes? Two questions. Is this on findagrave.com by any chance? I don't suppose they know what to call it on there. Would they? You know, that's a good question because I've used find a grave a lot, and I've never looked for this because I've been so intimate and close to it here. I've never worried about looking at find a grave. I would... It, it depends upon whether somebody took it upon her, themselves to put it on Find a Grave, because that's the way that works. Find a Grave is sort of like Wikipedia. You know, you can, be, you can contribute to Find a Grave, and it's not something where there's people out scouring uh, cemeteries just specifically to list people that are there. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, maybe. Yes? I have up here, well, I, de I definitely have up here a list of everybody that's in that cemetery, and you can look at that. I don't remember that name, so you'll have to look at the, at the listing and see what's there. But I've, got, I've actually got two things here. One of them is the known veterans that, that I knew of at the time that I created this, uh, and then a listing of everybody, approximately 60 people, family members and everything else that's in the cemetery that Patsy gave me. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are you talking about the one that I mentioned, the Giants in the Cornfield? Okay, yeah, you can go down to the Monroe County History Center and go to their gift shop. They've got one on the shelf there, I'm pretty sure, uh, right now. It's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's still in print, so you might be able to get it off Amazon, too. But uh, last time I looked, they had a copy of Giants in the Cornfield down there. And, of course, that's, the name is, it reflects the fact that, that these people were so tall. Uh, as I say, it didn't work out well in the end for them. Yes? A little bit off topic, but in the preservation of the, of the, of the gravestones, I noticed they were looking very nice and burning. You know, limestone deteriorates faster than granite and stuff. Are there treatments and things that could be done, or do you have any idea at all? Or? I, I would probably defer to Lou Malcolm at the Monroe County. His, well, she, I don't, she's not really an act, active person because she's moved out of town. She comes back once in a while. She used to be the cemetery. I've, I've never done much cemetery restoration myself, so I can't answer that. Uh, yes, I am concerned. I've also heard in a roundabout way that that the cemetery may be sort of on a bit of a downhill thing, too. I don't know where. I've been trying to contact family members, and I've been unsuccessful um, at, at just seeing. For one thing, I'd just like to be able to go out there again without getting shot. That would be a cool thing. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know, because the, the, her grandson built a house that's directly across from the entrance to the cemetery. And you would you'd have to drive up his driveway and park along the fence line across from his front door to go into the cemetery today, which I did drive up his driveway a couple of weeks ago. I took the chance, but I was going, I knocked on the door. There was nobody home. So I, I didn't find anybody that, and I haven't been back since. Yes, ma'am. No, uh, well, it's probably to your point, uh, there's a gentleman on the corner of where that cemetery is where he, he allowed us to go up to the pathway. So it's, it looks like someone's still mowing it. Uh, and, and things like that, but some of the stones kind of look like, you know, back yeah. to the picture that you mentioned. And that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a lot of work to get it back to where it was, and it takes a lot of work to keep it that way. Uh, in, in terms of mowing, uh, when I talked to Patsy originally on this, thanks, Patsy, um, she did have a township trustee who was doing the mowing service, and that may still be the case. Uh, I don't know. I haven't confirmed that, but she said, she said there were a couple of instances where they had a 15-year-old doing it, somebody's son, and he, you know, he'd run into a stone once in a while. But uh, yeah, well, he's not 15 anymore. I care. That's been several years ago. But um, but yeah, I, I I know there is another way up there, and I've never been any way except to go through the property that I'm talking about. So I don't know that. By the way, I should I should also mention when I said Sand College Road, there was the reason it's called Sand College Road is there was a little there was a little school there. And at that time, a college was a grade school. So that's the reason this is Sand College Road. And you 
never know it existed if you didn't go out that way. It's a pretty part of the county, too. And you go down over the hill, and you get some nice views of the White River. And you can see Gosport in the distance. Not, not too distant, either. Yes? Sir, having oh, I know. a workshop this fall, and John Waters is going to have to come in. Oh, is he? That's at the Monroe County History Center on Friday evening, and I'm not sure the date on that. It's August 10th, August 10th and 11th. Okay, I may have to go down and talk to him then. I have an uh, I didn't know that. Part, Friday part will be at the History Center, and the next day, that Saturday, will be at Rose Hill, so there will be a live workshop in there. Good, that's good to know. I, Unfortunately, my day job may preclude that at that time. I, st I still work, and I work in housing at Indiana University, and you can sort of imagine what's going to happen in the next few weeks. My life is going to become hell. It always does this time of the year, but it always goes away, too. It's all right. It's a living. It, it, it works. It's a good job. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I also remember reading, I don't know if it was at the History Center or where, but Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, circus trying to recruit Van Buster after the war to tour with their circus, and he turned it down. You know, I think, I, now, it's been a long time, I think I did hear that one time, and I can only imagine that he said, I'm not a freak show. Yeah. You know, uh, so, uh, and, and he was a prominent citizen the rest of his life here in the county. Yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh, you twisted my arm. <laughs> we started about 15 years ago. Me and two other people just decided this was a cool thing to do. One of the, the original founders with me had moved in from the Chicago area and had actually been a member of the South Chicago Civil War Roundtable, and I was volunteering at the History Center, and so was she. And she said, we ought to start a Civil War Roundtable. I said, oh, okay, sure. And I had no idea what that meant. And both of the other two people sort of very quickly fell off to the side. And, and it's, it's been me. Uh, and, and I have good people with me now. There's a good person back over in the corner of that room that I, that I couldn't get along without. Uh, I know. Uh, but uh, but at, it's, it's been 50. We meet on the second Tuesday, excuse me, the second Tuesday of every month at 7 o'clock at the History Center uh, from September through June. Uh, we don't have a regular meeting in December. We typically have a, a meal, uh, just a sort of a holiday gathering or something like that. But we try to have speakers from both outside, and we try hard to have our own speakers. Uh, we try to get people to do their own research or read a book or something like that. And, 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 yeah, but, but we meet at 7 o'clock. It's free. Uh, there's no obligation. Uh, come on down and join us. 7 o'clock, second Tuesday of every month unless something happens. And if you're interested in information about it, I can get you our website, and I can also uh, get you on our electronic distribution list so that you get meeting notices, and you'll see the dribble that I write in the newsletter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Civil War is a, is a very fun thing to do in one sense of the word. War shouldn't be fun. That's not the right way to say it. It's an interesting thing to do. Um, I was talking to Michael before the meeting that, that my wife has taken me on a trip to the Outer Banks, to Nags Head, North Carolina, uh, every June for the last three or four or five years. It's because of a family thing. And I go there because, uh, and I'm not a beach person, I can guarantee you, but I go there because I have taken my wife and dragged her over every battlefield and every historic site over the years, and I owe her way, way more than one beach vacation a year. Um, but I always have to find things to do while everybody else is on the beach, and this year I found it really interesting. If you're ever there, go to the, uh, God, it's the museum, the Maritime Museum of the Outer Banks or something like that. I can't remember the, the actual name of it now. But I went to a program there that was being done. They were having a civil war. There was a lot of civil war history every place, and they were having a program there. I got to meet the author of a book. I uh, had a very, very fine uh, time with him. 
listened to his program, and he took me over into the museum and talked to me about several things. Uh, it's just a fascinating place to go to, and there was there was action in in that area during the Civil War, obviously naval action. But there was a lot of shipping that went up and down the coast. Also, of course, uh, if you know anything about the battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack, the first battle between two ironclads in naval history, uh, it, it occurred, of course, off Hampton Roads. Um, but months later, the Monitor was being towed, and a hurricane hit them, and it sank off Nags Head, uh, off the Outer Banks. I don't know exactly where. And they have now taken, they found it, and they, they can't get it all up. It's just too deteriorated. But they did get the turret and a couple of the guns off the deck up. They're being restored at the, uh, in Newport News, at the Monitor Museum there, uh, Naval Museum there. Uh, again, fascinating thing to go look at. And they have a full-size replica. You can get out and walk around on the Monitor if you want. Uh, and, and you don't get wet. All right. Folks, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.